series so far hasn't really been, uh, well, things have been looked at at a political angle, but a, a, a very different one. Um, my background is, uh, uh, well, I'll tell you a bit about my background in a minute. I, I teach um, business and innovation to uh, uh, design students at Ravensbourne, which is uh, obviously just over the way, and uh, also um, teach in the School of Creative Industries at London South Bank University, so we're all, all on the river. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk this evening about two, two things. I'm going to look at the theme of, of diversity and inclusion um, from my experience over about 25 years of engaging with these kind of debates and also look at the theme of um, inclusiveness politically, which will sound like a bit of an odd thing uh, when I say it initially, but looking particularly at current events or events of the last few years and how the creative design community has responded to those things. So if you want to, these are all the hashtags and my Twitter handle, if anyone's got any connectivity, which I don't. Um, uh, I'm obviously keen to uh, promote these themes. So, um, what does she know of design who only design knows? And what does he know of people who only people knows? Now that sounds kind of uh, slightly contrived, but it's um, what I'm trying to get at with those two statements is that we need to, as people involved in design, we need to know about more than design. Um, I've described this, picking up on Tim Brown of IDEO's use of the term, uh, as a T-shaped people, people who've got uh, a depth, the stem of the T, to their, their skill, their knowledge, their craft, but also a breadth in the sense that they are aware of all the adjacent disciplines and domains uh, to their profession. And in design, that might be uh, sociology, it might be politics, it might be technology, it might be business. Um, it could be one of many domains. But in my experience, the people who are the most thoughtful designers, the most skillful in the broadest sense, are people who have uh, a breadth to them uh, as well as a depth. Um, so some of the themes I'm going to talk about today are, well, I'm going to try and explain what liberal-centred design is, which uh, is, um, sounds like a, a kind of uh, crazy idea. I'm going to talk about the challenges in the discourse about diversity, and also uh, <coughs> look at the challenge of diversity in how we think about politics of our fellow citizens. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about reappropriating humanism, which again sounds quite grand, but I think it's a fundamental aspect of the way in which uh, design has developed, certainly in the last century. And then about the need for intellectual confidence in, in design. And we'll see we're in a program here which does uh, bring a very rich uh, both tradition and breadth to thinking about design. So uh, let's say that I'm presenting this thesis as much to people outside this room uh, as educators and students and people involved in policy around design education as I am to you. Uh, so my background um, uh, in a number of phases, and I'm talking about this partly, I guess, to uh, establish on my experience some of the domains that we're talking about. So in the 80s, which I realize is uh, last century in many senses. I was involved in anti-racist campaigning uh, in East London and North London. Uh, this is a picture of the Cable Street anniversary march. Um, some of you, does anyone know where Cable Street is, even? No? 
Okay, well, Cable Street runs sort of between Shadwell and Limehouse on the north side of the river. And um, in the pre-war, well, the first part of the 20th century, it was a very poor area. It was also an area where there was large uh, Jewish immigration, primarily from Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, it was an area where there was a lot of racism and a lot of uh, activity by proto-fascists such as the British Union of Fascists. I know this is going to sound like ancient history, but maybe some of you in A-level history studied some of these things. Um, and it was a scene of a very famous and important demonstration, in fact, almost uh, really a, 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 a major fight between fascists and anti-fascists. The fascists were trying to march through the area and this is in the mid-1930s, so uh, those of you who do know your history will appreciate that was a pretty uh, pivotal time uh, in European political history. And many, many people came together from uh, the Jewish community, from socialists, uh, trade unionists, anarchists and others to confront the fascists in Cable Street. And uh, the police, which we say, didn't exactly do themselves proud. But uh, the anti-fascists did manage to stop Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists from demonstrating and did manage to turn them back. And that's you know, very significant in political history of solidarity between ordinary people in East London, trade unionists, socialists, and Jewish immigrants. And as a result, partly as a result, um, you know, they were defended against racist attacks, against discrimination, and so on. Uh, so this march took place on the 50th anniversary. There's some of our Bengali neighbors who are all grown up now, uh, watching on and various uh, banners and a copper looking more peaceful than they were 50 years before. Uh, this is a campaign, the East London Works Against Racism campaign, which was uh, very active in defending particularly Bengali communities in East London against racist attacks and uh, arguing that ordinary people should take sides with them, which uh, despite the diversity and uh, there's much more integration today than there was then, um, that, that was an important uh, thing to say that ordinary people have got more in common with Bengali immigrants and obviously immigrants from the subcontinent more generally as well as uh, black and other Asian immigrants than they have with the government at the time, which was uh, the, the Conservative government, or with you know, anyone who was arguing that um, somehow uh, immigrants were taking our jobs, taking our houses, and all those arguments that will be familiar to you. Um, I've also been very involved in trying to facilitate debate in the design world. This was a uh, organization I was involved in setting up in the early 90s called Design Agenda, it was originally Design Agenda for the 90s, which was responding to the lack of uh, what uh, a colleague and I felt was really thoughtful, well-informed debate in the design world, um, and trying to encourage designers and non-designers to take debate and discussion and didacticism, self-knowledge, or improving one's self-knowledge more seriously. Uh, this is a manifesto we published in, in 1994, and you can see some of the themes that we were talking about then, about uh, improving design education, or at least taking design education more seriously, uh, about um, uh, looking at issues of uh, sustainability and green, as it was called then, uh, in a more uh, critical way, uh, taking risks, that's something we still don't do very much. The idea of the universal designer, that designers should be people who are T-shaped, as I'm now characterizing them. Um, and we were involved in very high-level debates, writing articles, journalism, and so on, uh, and also uh, initiating events like this, which was the first conference in the UK about what we now call user experience or user-centered design. And again, user-centered is the key here. Uh, it was thinking about how do we really understand people in their diversity, uh, in their particular situation, um, with their particular characteristics, 
uh, and try and design things which are for them. And this is in 2000, which was really about five years after the web became the kind of mainstream thing, uh, was something that was very, uh, very much seen in its absence. Most websites were not designed thinking about users. They were designed, if they were designed in any way, to try and use technical tricks to impress people. Um, they were designed around the limitations of the technology or what the uh, designer, the company, the clients and so on thought was important to them rather than what was important to the user. So this was very significant and it's hard to appreciate now that you know, you're all familiar with using the web on multiple devices from smartphones to tablets to TVs to, to your computer. That there was a time when most websites were pretty much unusable and you really had to work hard to get them to work, whereas now all those kind of patterns, all those affordances, um, you know, which are enabled technically as well as creatively, uh, are in place. And arguably the web is perhaps rather homogenous as a result, but at least uh, it's useful. Um, I've also been involved in uh, done a lot of journalism and writing, um, uh, everything from books to papers to um, magazine articles, and this was about a conference which uh, was started at the Royal College of Art, uh, which was about, as you can guess from the title, inclusive design. Um, it was started by the Helen Hamlin Research Centre, which uh, was founded um, in the 90s, to essentially facilitate design research around people, particularly with physical and cognitive um, uh, disabilities. And one of the really interesting things that came out of this conference, um, which is, I don't think it's still going now, which is uh, unfortunate, but was the idea of inclusive design as a, a philosophy, which I'll uh, uh, flag up as being one of the key developments that we've, we've achieved in this area. But is the idea that designing things for people who have cognitive, motor, other physical disabilities and so on, actually is uh, a kind of universal benefit in the sense that many things that we design that facilitate people with those, in those, uh, with those conditions or those uh, disabilities are actually things which are valuable to everybody. And, but I just ask, who here is familiar with the idea of inclusive design? I'm kind of imagining that you all are. One, two, three, four hands. Uh, I mean, can, can you think of an example that you've learned about, which um, is an example of inclusive design which started off being solving a problem for someone not in the mainstream of users. Mm, eyewear, glasses. Oh, right, okay. Ooh, that's interesting. So what's the, what's the benefit to people who don't have sight impairment or? Right, okay. Yeah, very interesting. That's a, that's a nice thought. So it's about, it's a kind of fashion or aesthetic yeah. benefit, if you like. Yeah, that's nice. Um, the classic kind of examples, you probably, well, you probably don't remember this, but did anyone have a, a phone before feature phones and smartphones? Yeah, I mean, you probably, sorry, a brick, yes, that's the, the term we use. Of. So on certainly uh, brick phones after the first few generations, there was a technology and interface called T9, which essentially mapped letters to the numbers on the uh, the keys, uh, the 10 digit keys, and used uh, essentially very early artificial intelligence to work out that words that you were typing would sort of auto complete things. Now, you probably use something like this now if you use an iPhone or Android, if you use Swift Key, for instance, on um, uh, most of those platforms and on Microsoft platforms. Now, that was a technology which originally developed for people with uh, motor impairments because it allowed you to essentially reduce the number of interactions you had to make with a keyboard. The typewriter is a similar example. Um, if you think about it, almost any technology which allows you to improve some aspect of how you interact with or sense things, which could be visually, could be hourly, it could be in some other way, probably will help other people who don't have an impairment because it will actually increase their abilities. So that, that idea was a, a very important idea and um, 
uh, I think was one of the key ideas that came out of that conference. And it wasn't new per se, but it was one which got much wider uh, traction. So I've been involved in this area a lot one way or another, but I've also been involved looking at the kind of broader trends going on in design. And I want to talk about both some of the areas that we've made progress in in this area and also some of the areas where I think we've, uh, what should we say, run into the ground to some extent. And uh, I'm sure this will pick up on some of the themes of, of previous lectures which some of you might have, have attended. I haven't been able to review those, so I'd be interested to know, you know some of the ideas that I'm talking about if people have essentially argued contrary to those. So some of the uh, progress we've made, I've talked quite a lot about the insights of inclusive design, which I, don't, I think are hard to underestimate. And the idea that inclusive design is good business, and you know, we increasingly see that companies recognize both in terms of customers, just revenue, but also in terms of how they're perceived as a company and what we call um, corporate social um, responsibility uh, has become increasingly important, certainly in the last 25 years or so. Um, we're more aware of biases in design teams, more aware that we need to correct for them uh, in one way or another, and uh, I'm sure speakers have talked about those things uh, already to date. And certainly, uh, should we say, equality, which is uh, at least equality of Opportunity is, you know, the fundamental underlying concept here is, is a very important uh, idea, which you know, goes back to, to the Enlightenment, really. Um, we've got a greater focus on ageing. Now, I'm sure none of you think too hard about those things personally, but you know, we live in a country where demographically the greater proportion of people are over 65 than has ever been the case. Globally, the world is ageing, particularly apparently in countries like Japan, countries like Germany, uh, where um, you know, Germany famously three years ago uh, allowed almost a million uh, immigrants to essentially redress the imbalance in its, its workforce and uh, caring community and so on. Uh, and we're much better now thinking about good solutions for ageing, which include all sorts of challenges. I went to a seminar at Green Mary recently looking at how creative industries can design and create tools and environments and facilities for people with uh, dementia at different stages of dementia. That wouldn't have been something creative industries people, design people, would have been thinking about 20, 25 years ago. Um, clearly we have better technologies, better design techniques, uh, better research techniques for understanding those situations as well. And also we, it, partly because um, people who are now what we call elderly or aging are people who are baby boomers, the, the sort of um, you know, people who were born between you know, well, an immediate post-war period, they grew up in a, a, an age where design was you know, became something that was important, the, the 1960s when people like Terence Conran and Habitat and Italian design and so on were um, becoming important in the UK. So they ex have greater expectations of design and they won't accept things that are designed badly or have poor aesthetics or um, poor usability. Um, we've also extended uh, thinking and, uh, about diversity into architecture and urbanism uh, we've got better tools, as I've alluded to, for doing research in these areas. And the whole area of user research has spawned an entire industry in the UK that really wasn't there. In fact, the sponsors of the Design for Usability Conference, who I, which I flagged up earlier on, was a company called Flow Interactive, which set up in about 1998. And was really the first company to, do, to promote user research as a commercial thing to companies, agencies, governments who were designing digital interfaces for people. And I'm sure you're all familiar with user research, but there's always been user research at a marketing, marketing level, but there hasn't always been user research at the level of actually trying to understand uh, cognitively, socially, personally, how people might want to use things. Not necessarily asking them directly, but looking at their lifestyles, studying them indirectly. I mean, are people 
familiar with this idea, like ethnography, does that mean anything to you? So, you know, these are disciplines which uh, have already come on a lot in the last 20 or so years. Um, I've alluded to new technologies which have made it much easier to create things which can address uh, uh, issues around diversity, again, particularly where the issue is to do with motor or cognitive issues more so than around gender and sexuality and so on, which is the other side of the discussion. Uh, we have better heuristics for understanding what works well, what doesn't work well, what's the right way to go and what isn't. And also things like the fixer movement. Are, are people familiar with this concept of people who are kind of very, in very informal and lightweight ways, creating new things for people? There was a series on BBC Two, uh, beginning of last year, called The Big Fix, I think, or maybe The Big Life Fix, um, which was essentially taking a bunch of designers and engineers and setting them tasks to help people with particular uh, problems to uh, find a ways to help them live better. So there was a, a woman who had um, a condition which made her unable to write or draw. I think she'd been an artist. And they created a, a, a way for her to hold a pen that would allow her to draw in a way that, um, or draw or write in a way that, uh, which was negated the involuntary motion that was uh, a, a, an aspect of her condition. There's another boy, I think from Merseyside, who had a very bad skin condition, which made it very difficult for him to touch and hold things. And he was a passionate photographer. And they created a way in which he could take photographs, he was wheelchair bound as well, but he could take photographs uh, in a way that he could control the camera without exacerbating his condition. And uh, that kind of very practical approach to uh, dealing with, with diversity in, that, in those cases uh, is something which is much more viable now, partly because the tools and technologies and design techniques are more diverse, better known, and also people can share ideas more easily and get together and you can find people that you can help. Um, there's an organisation uh, called Fixpert, which if you're interested in this, you should uh, look up, which is founded by uh, Daniel Charney and Dee Halligan, um, and they um, both uh, facilitate this kind of activity and also document it very well. So that, those are some of the areas where I think there's been real progress. Now, I think there are some areas where we've, uh, what should we say, uh, I think I said run into the sand or created problems for ourselves. Now, I think one of those is and this is a sort of an issue that I'm going to come on to in the next part of the talk, is uh, we've, in the design community, become more orthodox in the way that we think about things and the way that we engage or choose not to engage with things and have tended to uh, allow ourselves to exist more within filter bubbles, which is, sounds like an old term. I wonder if anyone's heard of this term, the filter bubble. Um, could you define it? Um, it's sort of like they filter information out so they don't get the information they want. Yes, very good. <coughs> and it's a term coined by an American technologist called Eli Barissa. Um, and it's, uh, it's sort of capturing the idea that the internet, the web, allow us to have access to more information, more opinion, more diversity of ideas than we've ever had. And you would think that's a good thing, which it is. And yet the flip side of that, and almost the kind of necessary corollary of that, is you can find more people who share your views, who have the same ideas as you. And of course, this has been a huge theme in the news recently after the Christchurch murders attack, uh, and you know, people talking about uh, hate speech online, and uh, white supremacism and uh, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with the analysis of it but essentially arguing that these phenomena are exacerbated by the web and the internet and the dark web and so on. But I think we also see this on the 
the liberal, the progressive side of the discussion as well. Um, I think there's uh, quite an, uh, a serious problem as well where we're, as I would put it, turning equality upside down. And in a way, we've created a situation in which, and you can see this, I mean, I hope it's not the case in this university, but in many universities, the push to try and rectify inequality in the treatment, particularly of people uh, in an LGBTQ community or uh, to some extent around uh, uh, gender has allowed uh, essentially a, a dampening of free speech, uh, allowed people to either no platform or to kind of constructively disrupt debate and arguments and so on which might take place and we've seen this in many universities up and down the country and the uh, if you like the ability to assert your rights as someone who's a victim of discrimination or inequality and so on to shut down discussion and debate or to even uh, have a direct effect on in accusing someone of uh, discriminating against you uh, it's been pushing against traditional notions of justice and innocence until proven guilty and you know, the ability to be uh, duly, uh, if you like, judged for any potential misdemeanor that you've been involved in. And I think that's, that's something which I think is a very worrying development. I also think there's, and you've particularly seen this in the discussion around Brexit, been uh, a promotion of the idea of diversity for its own sake. Now, is diversity is neither a good or a bad thing. I mean, diversity is something which can enrich one's life, in which can, uh, for some people, they regard it as being something which is discomforting, disorienting. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, we need to be thinking about ourselves as all being human, all our blood all running red as they used to say in the United States in the days of uh, slavery and you know, the obviously formal inequality of blacks uh, in the United States before the Civil War. And I think celebrating diversity for itself doesn't make sense in a way, in that we should be looking for what we have in common and we should be trying to build common links between one another. And to the extent we celebrate it just because, you know, in, in East London, you can eat different food, buy different clothes, access different culture and so on, in itself is not a bad thing, but that misses the profundity of what it is to be human and what we have in common. And often I find the people who celebrate diversity are often the people who, if you like, are most homogenous in the more important parts of their lives. They actually, you know, they live with or marry people who are of the same class or uh, even, uh, genetic background. They mix with those kind of people, and their celebration of diversity is really not profound in the sense that all they like is the benefits of having access to different cuisines, or you know, even worse low-paid labour um, because people who come from Central Europe or elsewhere don't feel powerful enough in the labour market to be able to um, really assert themselves so they end up being people who are not very well treated and not very well paid labourers in the domestic area. So I think we have to be careful about celebrating diversity for its own sake and also you have to recognise that at some point, and you know, this comes to the kind of debates around intersectionalism, uh, everybody is different in some way from everybody else. And how granular, how much can you break down society between people who, uh, you know, there is no limit to how much you can see diversity. But if you always see diversity, then you're not seeing commonality, common interests, common uh, common objectives, common desires, common goals between people. Uh, I mean, you saw that even in the feminist movement 20 years ago, where there were divisions between 
feminists who were straight and feminists who were gay, or working class feminists, middle class feminists, and so on. Um, also, I think this is a sort of bigger issue, and I've seen this a lot in design in the last you know, 20 years or so, is that designers are rightly ambitious about their skills and how much impact they can make, and you know, understandably see themselves as being uh, not being given as much credit for the value of design. And you know, this is the case in the UK where we have a, a kind of engineering uh, and uh, policy-led culture. But I think we have to ask, does, is design, the designers always need to be solving social problems? I'm not saying this is necessarily how you see the world, but uh, I often ask the question of designers who want to solve the world's problems through design about whether they think that a plumber uh, should be doing the same thing. Should we have ethical plumbing? Should we have uh, plumbers who are fighting against uh, inequality and so on? Or uh, coders, or I would have said printers back in the day, but uh, there aren't that many printers around any longer and there's not as much printed as there used to be, or at least in comparison to what's digital. So I think we need to be a little bit humble about design and the power of designers and how we self-actualize through our profession. I think, as I'm going to argue, design has a very important role just in doing, doing good design. And then the, the last thing I see as being a, a real challenge is the lack of profound debate within the design community about what is good and what is ethical. And I think very often we take our cue about those things from uh, people outside our domain. So uh, probably, or maybe a bit young to remember this, does anyone remember or know of an author called Naomi Klein, American writer on, yeah? I've oh. not read it, but I know she is. Right, she <laughs> that's a good start. Um, so Naomi Klein's uh, essentially a kind of thinker, political activist, who wrote a book published in about 2000 called No Logo, which was really arguing that design has a profound influence uh, in terms of our consciousness, in terms of how we sold things, how brands work on us, um, uh, and it's a kind of manipulative thing. And it was a very influential book in the design community at the time. I'm sure Stacey remembers it from back in the day. It had a very distinctive cover as well black with a red and white type. And to be honest, there was a very uncritical reception of it, positive reception of it in the design world, and not much critical reception. And I think that was really problematic, because any profession should be able to generate its own thinking and its own ideas and its own theory. Not that it shouldn't bring it in from elsewhere, but if we respect ourselves as a profession, then we should be leading in creating new thinking which sort of goes beyond our, our domain. And I'm not saying there are no designers doing that, no practitioners, no industry leaders and so on, but I would argue that too often we allow in design the ideas to come from outside and we're uncritical about them. And that goes back 40, 50, 60 years. You can go back to E.F. Schumacher and Small is Beautiful to Vance Packard, a very celebrated American author in his book, The Waste Makers. Uh, and we keep ass assuming these ideas without, uh, without sort of reciprocating and without being as critical as we might be. I just want to talk a bit about the, what I'm calling the schism. I guess probably no people are particularly profoundly religious here, but I use the term schism, which comes from I mean, the original schism in the, uh, what became the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox Church was about a thousand years ago. Um, and I want to argue that while we're very embracing of diversity in aspects of uh, social and physical domains, we're not in the political domain. And I'm going to talk uh, about two areas. Uh, can anyone recognize the Face on the left. <laughs> Very good. Very confident about that. This is 
pretty much the most um, photographed person on the planet. Um, so naturally, in this context, the two schisms I'm going to talk about are uh, that one and that one. Uh, this is a, does anyone recognize, well, you're going to see the credit. Anyone recognize these images, know who created them? Don't read the bottom. Anyone? How good is your graphic design knowledge? Very good. Otherwise known as, or famous for? Yeah, the sort of a bit before that. Did you, does anyone know Obey the Giant? Yeah. Yeah? He's in the um, Texas and the gift shop. Oh, right. Ah, very good, you see? So you're going, going beyond your cultural realms. That's very good. Uh, Banksy films and so on. Um, I think, it, I mean, obviously these are great images and very... Uh, thought-provoking and so on. Um, now, uh, I'm just going to... Uh, um, excuse me just a second. So, yeah. Uh, I think that you know, these, these two events have caused a very profound schism within British and American society. It doesn't really need saying. But... Um, I think the design world has particularly experienced this, or the, I say the creative industries more generally. Do people know the term creative industries? It's sort of embracing film and television, theatre, visual arts, and uh, games industry and so on, uh, have been particularly discomforted and uh, disaffected as a result of this. So the creative industries and the design world itself has always thought of itself as being very liberal and open-minded, which you know, there's a uh, you know, profound truth underlying that. Uh, in the US, the design community has always, always, uh, certainly in the, the modern era, allied itself with the Democratic Party, and in the UK, and uh, arguably in Western Europe generally, with Labour and Socialist parties, not that Socialist parties really exist any longer, but some of the people I'm going to talk about a bit later on in the lecture are, are, are examples of that. Um, and they've allied themselves to what will be called progressive movements, um, you know, whether it's uh, the civil rights movement in the US or uh, feminism and women's rights in the UK, uh, or anti-racism, you might have seen on the pictures from the Cable Street Anniversary March, various placards from left-wing groups um, designed by David King, who was who died recently. He was a, a wonderful graphic designer and allied himself with left-wing and progressive causes. Um, I, I argue that in the UK, the design community has uh, adopted a kind of orthodoxy, as I alluded to earlier on, uh, and takes a lot of ideas for granted without questioning them and without really debating them. And I, you know, obviously I've been in and around the industry for a long time. I find it very difficult these days to find a really good place to have a debate about the issues around them that affect design. You know, you don't find them at the DNAD festival. You don't find them in the Charter Society of Designers. Uh, you don't find them in public lectures at design colleges, other than this one, obviously. Um, and I think that the, the liberal causes which uh, designers have tended to affiliate themselves with and often work for of gender, race, sexual equality, and so on, have, as I hope I've described, turned into something different. I mean, we haven't achieved equality in all these areas. But in a way, we've sort of gone beyond those debates to debating semantics, debating language, debating things that aren't actually affecting the quality of people's lives or equality. Uh, and in a way, we've kind of, what was a very liberal, progressive, enlightenment view has kind of been turned upside down into seeing heresy, seeing bad people everywhere, seeing microaggressions, uh, and while that's very virtue signaling, I uh, use that term cautiously, but I think it's got something behind it, the idea that you're more concerned about 
how you're seen than affecting the thing that you're apparently concerned about. Um, uh, that's really turned on its head the traditional progressive as aspects of those, um, those movements. Um, this has been accentuated by the filter bubble, by us tending to stick together in the real world in more homogenous groups. And in a way, there being fewer ways in which you do come across people who are different from you. Now, I think universities are an exception to that, you know, partly because more and more people go to university these days. Obviously, that means more diversity, and that's a very positive thing. But outside the academy, the institutions which used to bring people together in profound ways, which might have been a church or a mosque or a synagogue, it might have been a trade union, it might have been, well, workplaces are still moderately diverse, but probably less so than they were. It might have been a political campaign. Um, it might have been a school or a bake sale. Now, obviously, schools still exist, and people still meet at schools and so on, but schools themselves are often less mixed, and hence the people that you meet at the school gates are less mixed. I speak from personal experience. Um, so the institutions that, if you like, mix people up more uh, have tended to, to wither for one reason or another. Um, so both online and offline, we're less exposed to ideas which challenge us to ideas which might stimulate us to think in a different way. Um, and instead, we find ideas that reinforce them. Now, I'm very pleased if you argue back against me on this, because I don't want this to be the case. Um, but it seems to me that that's le led to a situation, we've got a broad depoliticization of British society, certainly until 2006, where we had a kind of technocratic way of doing things, where uh, decisions were made based on uh, evidence. So we had evidence-based policy. We had experts, and I know that's a controversial term, and that's something of an expert, you know, I should defend experts, but experts being brought in to decide things uh, and politicians stepping back from taking responsibility for decisions. We had um, supranational institutions creating legislation that meant that our politicians weren't really accountable for changes in society. Um, and that's led to a, a situation where essentially we're not used to politics and political debate and opposing ideas and really working them out in the kind of hothouse of uh, a student union, perhaps, uh, which I used to argue about when I was at university. We had 500 people in a student union meeting all shouting at each other, not always constructive, obviously. Um, and I think we've also uh, ended up kind of reducing the status of people, our fellow citizens, to being kind of consumers and now users and people who don't really have agency, don't really necessarily have the same standing they used to have socially. And then we had Brexit, June 23rd, 2016, and the election of Donald J. Trump, although, yes, he was elected by the Electoral College, not by a direct plebiscite, uh, like a referendum, but everybody voting directly on something. Um, and I think the what we've seen, I think, then, is a rejection of the idea that other people can have differing views from the prevailing liberal or perhaps neoliberal view in society, liberal from, from our point of view, and uh, an unwillingness to actually really engage in understanding where other people are coming from. Now, design has, in the modern era, always sought to try and understand people. We've talked about design research techniques. Uh, we've talked about designing for diverse kinds of users. And um, that has become a mantra in design, that you need to study your target audiences or your target users. You need to do ethnographic research with them. You need to really try and get into their lives. You need to have empathy for them and so on. But when it comes to politics, that empathy seems to go out the window, that nobody really wants to try and understand why people voted in a certain way. Um, so I'm going to, I had a slide about this, but I seem to have hidden it. Um, 
And the upshot is that in the United States, uh, people I know in the design community are, you know, they're, they're hostile to Trump. I quite understand that. I campaigned against Ronald Reagan. I actually went to the US and worked for an election campaign to, this is in the mid 80s, to campaign against Ronald Reagan, who probably most of you never heard of, but he was the kind of boogeyman of the era, him and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, so I completely understand why people are hostile to Trump. I mean, he's, you know, he's not the sort of person who one would hope would be leading, uh, you know, the dominant country in on the globe. But the reality is people did vote for him. People did react against his predecessor, you know, for all the Shepherd Fairy posters and so on. A lot of American voters felt very alienated by Obama, even more alienated by Hillary Clinton. You know, there was a reason that people voted for Trump. There was a reason that he appealed to people. People uh, need to understand that. And yet, on the West Coast, on the East Coast, where you know, Chicago, Austin, a few other places, Minneapolis, where the design community focuses and so on, there's a real difficulty that they have had in understanding why people voted for Trump. So they talk about middle America, you might have heard this term. It's like, if you live in New York, New Jersey, Virginia, uh, Maryland, and so on, middle America is that big bit that you fly over when you're going to California or you're going to Nevada or you're going to Colorado or somewhere. And it's a kind of very disparaging dismissal of you know, a huge group of people. And it's not saying that the coasts and middle America are, you know, the middle is uh, the middle is blue and the sorry, the middle is red and the coasts are blue and so on. But uh, that is the way in which it's presented. So essentially, they're kind of rejecting these people, and I think that has a profound impact on design because design has the ability to make people's lives better, to improve things for people. And if you don't see people as being worthy, if you see them as being people you just can't understand, then that has an impact on how you think about design, about your ambitions, about your humanism. Uh, and I think we see a not dissimilar thing in the UK. We see uh, in the Creative Industries, a survey done by the Creative Industries Federation in 2016, uh, found that 94% of people in the Creative Industries wanted, had voted remain, doesn't mean they wanted to remain, or they didn't accept the results of the referendum, but they were certain that was certainly a greater proportion than you would have found in almost any industry other than perhaps the tech industry, or um, actually that's probably academia, actually. Um, and uh, the, the result of that is that there's been the potential, for instance, for the design world design profession to actually facilitate designing how Brexit might work has been lost. Now that's a kind of radical idea. You know, obviously if you don't, if you want to remain, then you're going to do as much as you can to undermine uh, Brexit. You're going to not be wanting to support the activities of leave voters and so on. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm just a bit confused about where my slide is on this, but um, maybe after this. Now you're going to see my whole presentation before. Sorry about that. Um, so I would argue that the really difficult thing about diversity, diversity is a hard thing to get your head around to start with, but political diversity is in some ways even harder because it has more profound, most existential implications <coughs> for you. It's, you know, in principle, you can accept diversity in different domains in British society, because actually for a lot of people it has benefits, it certainly doesn't have detrimental effects. Um, obviously we haven't even had a debate really about how societies grow through immigration, how they grow through adapting to different um, ways in which people choose to live and so on. Um, and I think it's very dangerous when in the end, design, designers, the design industry has a narrative, and I'm not saying this includes people here, I hope it doesn't, 
um, but certainly you can see it more broadly where essentially it regards ordinary people as having been fooled into voting either for Trump or for, uh, for leave in the referendum. Or it questions their motivations for voting. So, you know, at best it says that they were, uh, what should we say, backward looking and nostalgic. At worst, it says they were xenophobic or racist. That's really not trying to understand people, or at least it doesn't seem to be a very profound understanding uh, of how people are motivated. It doesn't seem to be inquiring about uh, trying to understand what's changed in British society. Um, so I think, well, clearly I'm arguing that in the design community we need to be more open-minded about our fellow citizens. We need to be more empathetic, more desirous of knowing and understanding them and trying to get to the bottom of what is motivating them. And also, I hope, in applying our skills to helping them whether or not we agree with their political point of view because they are our fellow citizens and that idea of kind of solidarity and even common nationhood and so on is an idea which has you know, really been challenged where in a way we sort of see our affinities more with people in other countries not that we shouldn't have solidarity internationally but I see a lot of people in the design community who feel they have and probably do have more common with people in Mumbai or Moscow or Milan or Minneapolis or Shanghai or Guangzhou than they do with people in Middlesbrough or Newcastle or Swansea or you know even Glasgow. Well, Glasgow is not a good example but um, is it not a healthy thing when your community is made up of these not insignificant but kind of weak ties between people and maybe you don't even know who your neighbours are you don't interact in your local community you don't contribute to uh, your uh, civic society if you like or civil society so um, I just want to start just reprising a few themes and then uh, we can have a, a discussion, I hope, if I haven't been too didactic. Nico, yeah. I think we're over. Sorry. All right, okay. Yeah, I think that we should have some up in the next, like, yeah. two, three minutes. Okay. We'll have five minutes questions because we already gave the floor. Right, okay, my, my bad. Okay, so I just wanted to reprise some humanists who uh, have had a very progressive attitude towards their fellow humans. Abram Gaines, I know you've had a talk from his daughter, I think in this series or the last series, um, he talks about um, the common humanity that communication design can build on. Um, Lucien Day, who talks about wanting her work as a designer in the post-war period to really make lives better for ordinary people. Um, Buckminster Fuller, who talks about all humanity uh, having great potential which is a, a very universal idea that everybody uh, is, got, is on the same trajectory, if you like, has got a commonality. So the worst case in design is that it loses interest and richness because we're not really uh, as enlightened as we should be, not as universal, not as thirsty for knowledge. And the design world isn't taken as serious as it might be uh, because it's not as worldly as it should be and I give the example of Richard Rogers here who's an architect not a designer architects are designers but um, architects are an example of a design profession which has managed to rise up in society so it's taken more seriously um, designers aren't able to establish uh, the loyalty of clients because they're not broad enough in their thinking not catholic enough to be able to understand business and to be able to talk to different kinds of people about different kinds of things. And they're not empathetic enough with the craftspeople people they work with. They might be coders, they might be printers, they might be um, makers of some sort. So that's the worst case scenario. And the best case scenario is that design rediscovers the desire to help its fellow citizens. I'm not saying it's been lost. 
but as the examples I gave before show, I would argue, it's in abeyance. Um, the designers are unafraid of inquiry and finding out things that they may not like or may discomfort them or may uh, make them have to think very hard. Uh, that we promote more original thinking from within the design world and thinking which then influences other professions and domains and civil society more generally. Uh, that we have greater intellectual confidence about what we know and what we understand and that helps us to engage with lots of different groups and stakeholders, clients, governments and others. Uh, and that we have more ambition that our skills as designers can really transform people's lives in a positive way uh, and can make a real difference to the world on a large scale uh, and that we don't set our sights too low because design does have the ability more than ever to transform the world, uh, not on its own, but in collaboration with engineering, with politics, uh, with all sorts of other domains from the academy and beyond. So sorry for running over slightly, I hope uh, the general themes that I was talking about uh, resonated. I don't expect you to agree with me, but um, if people do have any questions, I'd be very pleased to uh, try and answer them honestly. And I'll have a drink of water too. you to go to lectures in other departments that you might think kind of like, you know, probably be a bit boring, but, you know, politics or sociology or, you know, engineering or other things. I, mean, I can't say I did this when I was at university. I go to more lectures at my old university uh, that aren't about my subject than I did when I was there. Um, and I would, I would also encourage you to be getting out and going to talks and events and so on else you know in London London is an amazing campus for learning I mean I can you know you could go to the Royal Society of Arts you could go to the Royal Society you could go to um, well there's a Royal in the Royal Institution but there are amazing things going on in London I mean there are every night there's three things I would want to go to and you know go to things that kind of mess with your head or you know ask some questions um, Go a bit off piste. Someone must disagree with what I said, or kind of go, this doesn't. Okay. Yeah. So you have you have an issue with people doing platforming, but what about when it's literally hate speech, for example, people who are like racist, or or they're like um, round up people into terrorist organisations and things like that? Yeah. Well, I mean, as it happens, we do have laws against. Uh, certain kinds of speech which are yeah, well, inflammatory. Okay, fine. Let me change my question slightly then. What if it's implied but not explicit things? So, like, speak is coming to try and get abuse as well. Speak terrorism without explicitly saying hate speech. Then. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think almost inve no, invariably the best way to deal with ideas that you disagree with is to take them on publicly and to criticize them and to show how hollow, bad, in bad faith they are. And a given example is um, a writer that I know of who in the 1960s at the University of California, Berkeley, which was a center of radicalism, uh, someone who was a particularly notorious right-wing speaker came to speak on the campus and worse at Berkeley now, they do no platform people, but back then this person was allowed to speak, but from the audience, so many people asked intelligent questions, responded with thoughtful, critical answers, 
that this person was essentially humiliated, for want of a better term. And if people see that, you know, people who might be influenced by them see really thoughtful, intelligent uh, criticism leveled at them, you know, they're going to be less likely to uh, go with their ideas. And I do worry that sometimes the tendency to want to exclude people is because you kind of don't like their ideas, but you don't know how you would argue with them. And you're not knowledgeable enough, you're not versed enough, and in a way it's a kind of, lazy is probably the wrong word, but it's, uh, it's the easy way out. And I think that the, the problem with that also is that people who might be sympathetic to those ideas, if they see those people being no platformed, then it actually makes them more attractive in some way, because they're kind of like, you know, it's a bit illicit, it's a bit... And I think, say for instance, Facebook today are saying that they're going to uh, essentially remove any white supremacist hate speech on the platform. And as you've alluded to, it's difficult sometimes to identify even what that is, but I would say that Facebook should be getting together people who can argue well against it and say, okay, this person's made this argument, go at them. But isn't, sorry, but isn't the problem with Facebook that they literally, literally talk about who themselves are, so there's a reason that you can't have, people can't argue on Facebook because it's just filtered to who it's sent to. It's yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess, well, I mean, because you can have private groups on Facebook, so. Uh, well, it's not just private groups, like the algorithms on Facebook. Yeah. Like, yeah. If you're a racist person, you're going to get all these white supremacist pages and you're not going to see any of the negative arguments against them. Yeah. Whatever positive arguments against them or whatever you want to say. Yeah. So the fa Facebook, I don't really think, is a good example of something like that because of the way that it's set up, like because of the algorithms and things like that. Yeah, and Facebook would have to change to some extent the yeah. way it works for that to, to happen. But. You know, I mean, Facebook is a work in progress. And, uh, you know, likewise, I think it's always, I mean, I remember when I was at university, um, I think it was, it was Douglas Hurd, I think, or one of the senior conservative ministers at the time came to speak, and, you know, it was obviously, there was a lot of hostility to them because of what they were doing to, you know, working class people and Section 28 and these kind of things. And you know, I was one of the people who spoke up in the student union to criticise him, to, you know, question what the conservatives were doing in government. and a lot of support for that because you know, people knew they kind of didn't like this person they didn't quite weren't quite able to voice it and uh, I think there's a, a real problem in, in our society that we've kind of covered over uh, differences of opinion by allowing it to be given that kind of a liberal worldview which is not a bad worldview in and of itself is the only one and by almost making it a matter of manners that you shouldn't say certain things, that they're just not polite things to say. And I do worry about that because it doesn't mean that people don't think the things they think, it just means that they have been sort of socially ostracized. Again, is that your first Yeah, yeah. Covered. So this is your, your worldview is that it's a liberal sense as well, but that's really because of your filter bubble. Actually, there's loads of people out there who are happily saying all these things and agreeing with things in tabloids and things like that. Yes, yeah, no, I, I take your point. I guess what I'm saying is that there's yes, all those diverse points of view, for better or worse, exist. Um, but there's, there is a sort of broadly accepted point of view. I mean, we know that you know, to say something racist in modern British society is not acceptable. Now, you go back 30 years, and, you know, you've seen it on the television. You'd have walked down the street and someone would have been saying things that would be completely objectionable now. And no one would challenge them. They wouldn't be chastised for it. But I guess my, my issue is that we haven't, I think, won the argument about why racism is bad and why, you know, why we... We, you know, we should have we have more in common with ordinary people from other uh, ethnic backgrounds than we do with you know our political masters or our bosses or whoever. We've sort of we've said you just can't discuss that, 
and I think it's what I mean. You know, those people's you know, people are still thinking those things. That it will come out in one way or another, and often a way you don't like it. I mean, a lot of people see Trump, you know, to some extent, rightly as being the revenge of the people in America who were told they couldn't say things and told that they just had to think things were right, you know, as they were. And they took their revenge by electing Trump. But sometimes, you know, it's also a cultural thing because mm. you talk about the, the British society. And yeah. You said how political correct it is. And that. But sometimes it might be the fact that uh, it's so integrated into different cultures that it might be like it, something that might sound uh, ra racist in, 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 in UK, in Britain, yeah. it might not be in another country. Yeah. So, and I think that uh, this kind of like uh, uh, messages that maybe we might have grown with or we might have been educated in a certain way, that it's very difficult to, to, to um, disconnect and maybe live on the side. So, I think that something that it might be very correct here. Might not be as correct in, in I don't know, in, in a smaller island somewhere. Right, yeah. As well. Yeah. But so, what, what's the consequence of that phenomenon? So, if someone from the UK goes to another country, are you saying that they're more likely to say things that offend people in that country? or well, they're... It might be perceived as an offense, but actually, it might not be intentionally. Yeah. It yes. might be like, for example, that, or the other way around. So I'm trying to say here is that this kind of like uh, um, the globalization and the, and the free movement and the, the more often that we go travel and go around, actually uh, it's, it might be an issue. Yes, yeah. But you might not. It depends. So yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean that's, a, that's certainly a scenario. I guess I, I'm thinking of a scenario within a kind of common culture. But, you know, and that's an argument for why you know, we need to be more universal and uh, aware of and yeah. sensitive to other cultures. I mean, it's probably less the case now because, you know, media has globalised the world and world cultures for better or worse. And yeah. Great. Uh, right. Any other question? Can no. I ask one before we finish? Yeah, right. <laughs> I was waiting for everyone else. But, um, okay, so mine is a little bit, it's a slight disagreement, but only a slight Good. Right, yeah. From disadvantaged areas and people from Central America. Because before that, they were just invisible. Mm. And then suddenly, this shock to kind of liberal America and liberal UK meant that actually people were starting to think, well, who are these people? You know, what are their lives are like? What is the reason? You know, is it the London, London centricness of the UK? Yeah. Is it the fact that the All right, okay. Is the story? Is it the fact that people um, lost hope? Lost yeah. Will? Yeah. Society into actually thinking, we need to understand these people better. Yeah. Well, I, I, I certainly would hope that would have been the case, but I don't see clear evidence for it, I have to say. I mean, the, the narratives, and I, you know, I've been very involved in these kind of debates and so on, and, you know, obviously I exist within a certain filter bubble I like. I mean, my friends sort of divide more equally between Leave and Remain in this case than for most people. Yeah. The, the referendum on the side, yeah. the leave and remain on the side, and the debates about the EU on the side, but actually the kind of question of, you know, who are these people, what are their lives, yeah. you know, the kind of road shows where people are going and asking questions and going to those communities, who would have gone before to Sunderland, who would have yeah, gone sure, to South sure. Wales, who would have gone, where would the press ever be there, yeah. and now they're there, yeah. and that's, that's the switch that I see. And yeah, like, yes, okay. Yeah, then I think that is the case. So Sky News uh, running road shows around the country and trying to get voices from people who are, you know, not the usual suspects and so on. That's very healthy, and to the extent the media are doing that, that's great. But I guess I'm thinking about more specific, you know, creative industries, design and so on, where I've seen a kind of desire to switch off, to deny, to. Um, to be pejorative about 
people who voted the way that you don't like. I haven't seen you know, the, the kind of desire to understand that you see in the design process. I haven't seen applied when it comes to thinking about political phenomena. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm be pleased to be proved wrong. But I don't, like, you know, just for instance, you know, I, I wrote a piece uh, and gave a talk about why designers should be designing for Brexit. You know, bring your skills to the biggest national project um, that you know we've had in the post-war period, and there's been no response to that. Now, I'm not saying everybody would know about it and so on, but I don't see the design world saying we want to make this happen. We want to make it as happen as well as possible, we want to realise the possibilities, because it's it's still in denial. That's a slightly different thing to actually the communities and the people. Yeah. Because the one is a kind of political decision of the political direction of the country to be taken, and the other one is a kind of economic and social decision of the country No, no, I agree. They are they are separate things. I, I guess I'm, you know, I may have not, I may have missed it, but I haven't seen that that dynamic within within the creative industries more generally. To be honest, and I showed a picture from the Creative Industries Federation Brexit conference, and there were a few voices there which were going against the grain, but by and large, it was a kind of you know amazement, shock, you know, what's going to happen to the arts. Uh, what's going to happen to creative industries and so on, how destructive what's been done is. Uh, but, you know, I'd love to be proved wrong. I mean, this is, you know, I really want to see our profession community, you know, being, uh, you know, going back to some of the people I, you know, I showed, you know, Lucian Day, um, uh, Bertolt Lebeckin, yeah. you know, Abram Gaines, uh, you know, Buckminster Fuller, you know, there people who really, you know, they were passionate about humanity. They were passionate about making things better for yeah, people. Yeah, but thinking about games. Yeah. Talking about politics and design at the time. Yeah. The Churchill was the one that he banned once before. Right? Yeah, yeah. So that's because he said, no, this doesn't happen in Britain. So yeah. I think we have to close here. Yeah, yeah. We do. Yeah, it was, yeah. Actually, it was actually Ernest Devin, who was a Labour oh, really? minister in the National Government. Who, who banned, well, I think it was the Finsbury yeah. Health Centre poster, which is you know, even more shocking because. Which make our game more famous, actually. Yes, no, sure, sure. But anyway, that's a, it's great. a very, very good point. Thank you very much for coming tonight, right. that was great. Thank you very much, and thank you for your good questions, too.